Hey everybody, I figured it's been a while since I did a video feature for uh, the patrons and for everybody else. And so I'm going to take a few minutes here. I don't know how long this is going to take, but the occasion is this. In addition to recently completing my own first ever crime noir novel, heist novel, caper novel called uh, Vegas Heist, which should be out sometime later in 2018. And if you'd like to get a copy of it, go to www.plexico.net, P-L-E-X-I-C-O.net, www.plexico.net. I'll put the link in the, in the information here on the YouTube page and on the Patreon page. Um, that's my own novel about a team of uh, Parker-style uh, burglars, criminals, uh, lovable, mostly, criminals, uh, trying to knock over a Vegas casino. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is the classic, the greatest of all, uh, Donald Westlake writing as Richard Stark, uh, the Parker novels. Because as of this morning, as of this morning, which is February 21st, 2018, I have just finished my, my reread of the entire original Parker series in order from start to finish. I have not yet reread the second series from 1997 into the 2000s. I'm saving that when I'm going to take a little break so it'll be fresh again. See, when I originally read these books uh, years ago, I think, it, in fact, it was probably the Mel Gibson payback movie that first introduced me to Parker. After seeing that movie, I went and got The Hunter and then kind of went and, and... But actually, now that I think about it, for some reason, I'm not sure why this happened. It may have been availability. I think I actually bought the, um, I got Comeback, Backflash, Flash Fire, and that. I think I ended up reading the later series first and then going back and reading the early ones. So, so my goal this time around was not just to reread the entire series, and that's going to include the Growfield books too. Uh, I've got a few things to say about old Alan. Um, but to do them all for the first time in the right order. So I'm reading uh, the entire series in order. Now, I'm going to save the Growfields for the end, even though that's not exactly the chronological order they came in, for one simple reason. I just read them like a year or two ago. So I don't want to go back and reread a book that I just read and is still fairly fresh in my mind. So I'm going to, I've just finished this entire stack. Here's, they're sitting on the table, and yet you can still see them on the camera way up here. Here we go. I've got the University of Chicago, good old... Uh, Levi Stahl, who was my guest a few weeks ago on the podcast, uh, Levi's company, University of Chicago Press, reissued all of them. Oh, there they are. You'll notice that there's only one of them. I don't have the Chicago Press edition. I have other editions over there on the shelf of some of them, but there's only one that I don't have any copies of the Chicago Press, and that is the Jugger. So I'll probably end up... It's one of those things where do you really want to spend $15 for a different cover of a book you already have? But honestly, just to have the uniform oh, you know, on the shelf, I think I might go ahead and pony up to get that last one I don't have in this edition because these are really nice editions. Also, they are on Audible. And so I was able to get most of these on Audible. And so I've been alternating between reading them and listening to them. So I've recently been very immersed. Pretty much January and February of 2018, I've been very immersed in the Parker series in this reread. And I've really enjoyed and listening to it, right? Listening to these great readers. And I'll tell you this. One thing I was very impressed with with the Audible editions is that I only have one complaint. Let me go ahead and get the one complaint out of the way first. And then I'll talk about what's good. The one complaint I have is that not all, but a couple of the readers, the performers, a couple of them try to make Parker sound like Batman. And it was extremely distracting to me and kept taking me out of the story. And in fact, if Parker had more dialogue in these books than he does, it would really be distracting. But of course, fortunately, he doesn't say a whole lot. But there are some... There are some... Uh, who they their Parker is all right, fine, go over there. And I just kept seeing, you know, cartoon Batman or movie Batman. It was extremely distracting. Others just had Parker sound like a deep voice, normal, you know, 
all right, Parker said, that kind of thing. That's not so bad. So some of them do that and some of them don't. Now, what I really liked about the Audible versions is that those readers were very good at making almost performances out of the books, meaning that they brought out things that when you're kind of reading along and you're, you know, you're really enjoying the story and you're turning the pages, you don't necessarily always take the time to put the full performance on in your head. You know, in other words, you're so busy trying to, oh, this is great, this is great, go, go, go. You're just zipping along that you don't take the time to hear the performance like it was a movie or a stage play. But the audio readers, of course, they take their time and they do the nuance and they do the performance. And so a lot of the personality that, that Stark slash Westlake puts into these stories, into these characters, really comes out in the audio. So I would recommend to you that rather than spending a fortune on all of them first, like I did, well, I, I did over time, uh, what I would recommend is that first get one, maybe not even the hunter. Um, pick one that you really like and um, get it on audio and try it. And you'll see what I mean, that it's really a different experience to hear it in some cases, at least to me. It may not be to you, but to me, than it is to read it. All right. So let's, without further ado, let's get into the book. Because I'm not going to give full reviews of these. I'm just going to go through them one by one and, and hit a couple of highlights and lowlights and, and what I thought about them. And we'll see which, one, which ones I ended up liking the most and which ones I ended up liking the least. And if there were any surprises. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about here. I have nothing planned. I have nothing written down. I have no agenda other than stream of consciousness. Here's my reaction. Having just read these books one after the other, I mean, they are like literary potato chips. I went romp, 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 romp right down through the pile. And so I'm going to say, here's what's in my mind now, having just read them. And I wanted to do it now when it's all fresh in my mind. Okay, so some of these go back early January, but hopefully I'll remember enough. Because I have read them all twice now. All right. <laughs> the Hunter. This is the one that kicks the whole thing off, obviously, and starts it all. And uh, also, of course, has the, the Darwin Cook graphic novel of this one and the outfit and the score and Slayground. Well, if we could have only gotten more Darwin Cooks, bless his heart. Poor man. Wish he was still around. Um, I didn't love this one. Um, it's okay. Uh, but we don't, you know, Parker is still very much proto-Parker in this book. His personality hasn't fully formed. And so all I'll say about The Hunter is I really like Payback, both versions. I like Point Blank. Those are the th those are the two or three, depending on how you look at it, really, movies that have been made um, about this book. Um, but it's not my favorite. I mean, it's a revenge story. And, you know, that's about it. There's not really much of a caper in it. Um, so I'll give, let's see, I'll give this one four stars just for being the first Parker and having some good stuff, but it's not my favorite. Okay. The longest title in the series, I guess, The Man with the Getaway Face, the second book. And it's kind of the middle part of this opening trilogy that also includes the outfit. And The Man with the Getaway Face, I actually remember liking this one better the second time because it has all the business with the plastic surgeon and his weird people that hang around his hospital, his little clinic in Kansas or wherever it is. And it has Parker kind of on a mission. Again, it's not so much a heist. Um, well, there is a heist going on, but that's not the main thrust of the story. So I'll give this one four stars as well out of five. Um... I like the idea, but the, the one funny thing, though, is that because Parker has plastic surgery in this book to have a different face, for like the next five books, it seems like, every time he meets somebody he knows, we have to go through this whole thing again about, I don't know who you are, I'm Parker. Well, you don't look anything like Parker. And then he acts like Parker, and like, oh, yeah, nobody's as big of a jerk as that. You're Parker, right? But And it's cute the first couple of times, but thankfully, after about four five or six books, Westlake kind of said, okay, now everybody knows he's Parker. Apparently, word got out, which is like, well, if everybody knows this is Parker's face, what was even the point of having your face redone, right? <laughs> so, and of course, ultimately, 
by the end of the third book, he's made a deal with the mob anyway, the syndicate, the outfit, so it doesn't even matter anymore. So he gets plastic surgery in book two. They're still talking about it in like book six, and yet after book three, it doesn't even matter. So these are just things that happen when you're writing a series and stories are kind of coming, you know, one after the other. But anyway, yeah, four stars for I like the stuff with the um, with the people trying to track uh, Parker down because they think he killed the plastic surgeon, that kind of stuff. By the way, I will be having some spoilers in here, but not too many. Um, okay. The outfit, this one is pretty much Parker going after the, um, closing out the deal on the opening trilogy, going after the guy, uh, Bronson, played by Chris Christopherson, of all people in the movie, uh, for, um, he's going after him because uh, he still wants his money from, that Mal took, or Val. He's Mal in the books and Val in the movie. Okay. Of course, he's Porter in the movie. Um, this one's three and a half stars for me. I don't love it. It's okay. But by this point, uh, he's really established, Stark, Westlake has really established this formula where you, you, you spend at least one of the four parts really getting to know either supporting characters or the antagonist, the villain, so that you understand why you should care about them when Parker goes after them or when Parker helps them or whatever, depending on what character they are, right? So, um... He'll stick with this formula for most of the rest of the books, where you get basically four parts. Three parts are Parker. Uh, one is like the setup of what's going on. One is things start going wrong. The one is the from the about the other characters, and then in the fourth act, you come back and resolve everything, and Parker settles everything. So, three and a half for this one because it's just the opening trilogy is not my favorite. It's, it's good, but it's not not my favorite. Um, I was surprised that I liked them less than I remembered I did. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be more detailed here and more quantitative about it, but I, uh, I really can't. It's just a matter of feel. Okay, uh, well, let's move on. We've got others to talk about. Uh, the Mourner. Now, see, I really like this one a lot better than I remembered because this one is a heist. This is, a, this is the first one that is purely a heist uh, where he's going after these statues. And it has really good uh, supporting characters. It has interesting people he's dealing with. Um, he has his single-minded determination to get the objective. And it's a self-contained story. So um, I'm going to be giving all these books either three and a half, four, or five stars, I think. So we'll give this one four and a half, actually, because I really enjoyed this one a lot, and I like the supporting characters. Oh, the score. Here's the one where Westlake pulled it all together. For me, this is the Parker novel. Okay, there are others that are great, but for me, this is the seminal. If you're gonna just read one, right? I mean, there's a reason why uh, why Darwin Cook, out of the four that he did, this is one of them, is because this has it all. It's 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 one big heist from start to finish. It's got a loose cannon crazy guy on the team that messes things up, right? It's got Alan Grofield, who, let me go ahead and say right now, and I'll say again as we go along, as reading the second time through, Grofield, I, I've come to just to really appreciate and enjoy that character more and more. He was, you know, the first time I read him, he was kind of a wacky, weird guy, and you know, you, the whole thing about how he hears music in his head, he thinks he's in a movie all the time. But as you read these books over this, uh, all the way through again, in order, you see, you see Grofield evolve where he's kind of a throwaway character in the score. He's the guy that, you know, he, uh, you know, he hears the music and uh, he's always like acting like he's Humphrey Bogart or something. But as you go through, you realize he's really, he's really the other side of Parker. He's the counterpart to Parker. And when, when, when it's just Parker and Grofield together, when it's just the two of them, it's such a great formula. Because Parker and Grofield together are like Batman and Green Lantern. You know? Um, I would say Batman and Superman, but Grofield is not Superman. <laughs> not in any way. But it's like Batman and Green Lantern, where you have Parker, who's just kind of the, the, the quiet, grim, gray, taciturn guy, who's just kind of 
you know, growling at the other persons, at the other people in the room. Then you have Grofield like, well, friend, let's see if we can work something out here. You know, my friend Parker might not like it if we can't work out a deal. So you have those two. They're kind of two sides of the same coin. And, I, and I've got to say now, I'll mention it at the very end, that's one of the saving graces for me of Butcher's Moon, the last book. One of the few things I really love about Butcher's Moon is the few chapters where we get Parker and Grofield together, the dynamic duo uh, dealing with bad guys. So more about that. But the score, Copper Canyon, um, there's so much good going on in this story. It's one big, it's even referred back to several times in the later books. It's so important. It's one big caper, one big heist. They steal an entire town. Okay, it's fantastic. And he pulls it off. So this, to me, is the quintessential Parker book. And it's early enough in the series that a lot of the things haven't gotten kind of used. And you're like, oh, here we go again, right? You're meeting a lot of the heisters for the first time. And it's cool to see Parker kind of leading that. So I'm going to give the score 5.1 stars. This is a wonderful book. I love the score. Then comes, and here's my old uh, Mysterious Press edition. Got to get the other edition of this. Uh, the Jugger. This one is interesting. This is the most sort of murder mystery, in a way, book of the series. And it's really interesting. This one, I think, is underrated. Because, you know, in the early books, Parker's contact, where people can reach him, is through Joe Shear uh, out in uh, Sagamore, Nebraska. But um, later on, it's Handy McKay in Presque Isle, Maine, up at the diner. But here, this is what happens to Joe Shear. Okay? And what I love about this is, you know, there have been so many stories where you have, like, the big uh, throwing his weight around sheriff or cop, police chief, whatever, who tries to, who is as corrupt as any criminal, but tries to muscle the, the, the bad the criminals around and he's really the bad guy that's what you have here so there's this really interesting really despicable character in this book that makes this story even more interesting parker trying to deal with him and it's kind of cops and robbers where the cop is worse than the robber by far so i really enjoyed the jugger uh and i recommend it i actually going to give this one four and a half stars which i never would have expected before because it again it's a self-contained uh, Parker on a mission and I know that Westlake felt like he kind of messed up here because he thought in his recollections he thought that he had Parker go and try to help Joe Shear who was in a bind and he felt like Parker would never go just help somebody but he actually has Parker go and try to do whatever he can to eliminate the possibility of Joe Shear giving Parker's identity away. So you get the sense that if, if that means Parker can help Joe Shear, he'll help him. And if it means Parker will have to kill Joe Shear, he will kill him without a second thought because he's Parker, right? He's an automaton. He's a robot. He does what he has to do. So I think that, that Westlake actually sold himself short on this one because Parker doesn't uh, try to help him. He does whatever he has to do to keep that information contained. I tell you, when Parker actually helps somebody is in Butcher's Moon, and we'll get to that. Next up is The Seventh. I really, really like this one, too, because this book is two completely different stories, more or less, blended together. I think this is really an ingenious story. It's a very thin one, right? It looks like it's hardly... It's, it's like, let's see... This one is only 150-something pages, 155 pages. But I really like this one. I love that it's, it's the one where you can tell where you are in the series because the title is both a play on words. It's the seventh book in the series. And also there are seven heisters, seven burglars in this, uh, in this story, and they each get a seventh of the cut, or they're supposed to. And then there's a play on that toward the end, not to spoil it. This one, they rob a football game. How awesome is that? They rob a football game while it's going on. And then it turns into like this story where Parker's tracking this guy, the amateur, down. So um, this one actually was, is people don't realize this, this one was actually turned into a graphic novel by Darwin Cook as well. It's only probably about five or six, seven, eight pages. It's really economical the way he does it. Uh, at the back of uh, the score, I believe. At the end of the score graphic novel, you find the seventh. I'd forgotten it was back there until I reread the score graphic novel. 
I'm going to give this one the heck with it. Five stars. Great stuff. Love the seven. Five stars. All right. Next up is the handle. This one is another one I think is underappreciated, undervalued, um, because this is another big heist. It's a big operation going on. Basically, the new head of the outfit knows how dangerous Parker is. So rather than getting into another conflict with him, he actually calls Parker in and basically con subcontracts his crime out to Parker. He gets Parker to put together a string and go, off, go after an offshore casino run by a former Nazi. You can't make this stuff up. So some of it's kind of silly, and we do lose a character or two in this that I really liked, unfortunately, but that does happen, obviously, in, in this business. But... Um, I think this one is underappreciated. I really like it. You get some good Growfield stuff in this one that I really enjoyed. Um, so I think this one is underappreciated. A lot of fun. It's a it's a heist. It's a big operation. I'm giving this one. I'm going to give this one four and three quarters stars. There's a little bit about it that that kind of drags in the at the, about the half to three quarters point, if I remember correctly. But pretty much this one's four and three quarters stars. I liked it more than I remembered. All right, we're almost, I think we're one, two, three, four, seven, eight, so we're about halfway through. Uh, next up is the rare, the rare coin score. Now, this one, of course, is not as popular with some hardcore Parker fans because everything else aside, and some of you know this, this is the story where Parker meets Claire. Claire Carroll, uh, Claire Willis, whatever you want to call her. We never know her real last name. But here's the thing, if you like Claire, uh, if you like Claire, and I'm a big Claire fan, I like Claire. Or if you don't like Claire, and there are people that can't stand her and think she ruins Parker, you will be seeing Claire pretty much every book after this, all the way until the very end in 2008 or whenever. Yeah, 2008. So you'll you're you're with Claire from here on. And I really like Claire. This is the one where there's a rare coin show going to be happening, and Claire has a, I want to say he's a friend. He's a, he's an in-law of one of her relatives or something like that. And he's the most, I think he's probably the single most annoying character in the entire series. And he pulls Parker into this deal to rob the coin show, and chaos ensues, but Claire is a strong presence in it. So... This one I'm going to give four and a half stars to. I like Claire. I like, I think the annoying, the annoying guy is an interesting character, even though he's annoying. And if you don't think he's annoying, listen to the audio book of it. Right? I have this, this is, I listen to this one on audio and I'm just like, I can't take much more of this guy, but it's a really good story. So four and a half stars for the rare coin score. Next up is the green eagle score. And this one I really like as well. I like all of the score books. The four there's these there's these um, there's these four in a row that he I think they're called the um, they were written for Gold Star is the publisher I believe they the four were under, under a contract to Gold Star. I think that's what it's called. If I'm wrong, I apologize, but I think that's what it's called, right? So you 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 have the the rare coin score, the Green Eagle score, and the next two are in kind of this quartet of scores and the green eagle score this one they rob an air force base <laughs> not the same air force base that pops up in i think lemons never lie because honestly the the air force base that growfield is involved in in robbing in lemons never lie uh is the one right down from my house and down from where i work in, in near belleville illinois scott air force base so i think that's hilarious but this one's a different air force base up i think in new york i think it's up in upstate new york but this one's good. Uh, it's another one of these big. I like the one where put. I like the ones where Parker puts together a team, and goes on this like operation, this junket. They go to some place and they go in after an objective. And they have to do a bunch of stuff to get it. Inevitably, at least one of the people turns out to be no good and messes them up, and they have to deal with that. So I really enjoy this one. I'm going to give the Green Eagle score four and a half stars as well. Up oh, the black ice score, possibly the least popular in the entire series. Uh, this is the one, for different reasons, but I enjoyed this one better the second time than I did the first time. And I think it fits right in with these four gold star uh, 
uh, the score books. Um, the Black Eye score, Parker gets involved with some uh, people from an African embassy, from an African country, trying to steal diamonds uh, from another, like a dictator that's involved, and it gets kind of convoluted. The parts that aren't that pleasant, there's these long graphic sections where the some of the staff members of the African embassy are having to commit murder and really bloody, gruesome murder. And Westlake spends a lot of time inside their heads with what they're going through in having to kill people really for the first time, for example. And it's an interesting character study, but Parker's nowhere to be seen, obviously, during those sections. And you're just kind of like, it's, it's kind of icky. You're wanting to get back to Parker doing cool stuff and not these young men having philosophical, you know, internal monologues about murder. It just gets a little old. So, and there's some stuff where Claire is kind of a victim and she doesn't really get to do much. So I'm going to give this one three and three quarters stars. It's not as bad as I remembered, but it doesn't reach up to that level of the four star or five star uh, books, but it's not horrible. Okay. Uh, the last of that quartet is the Sour Lemon Score. And this one is the beginning of the George Ool storyline. He pops up a time or two after this. This is one where they pull off a great heist, everything's going great, and then one member of the string starts betraying and trying to kill everybody. And Parker spends the rest of the book trying to track this guy down before that guy tracks him down and kills him so that Parker can get all the money back and all that. So it's a, it's a great kind of, I like when there's a, when there's a heist and there's a villain and there's like a personal stake between Parker and the villain, right? So you get a heist story and you get Parker after somebody. When you can combine those two things, you really have a really complete Parker story. So I'm going to give the Sour Lemon score four and one quarter stars. There's stuff about it that's, that kind of drags and it's kind of not that great, but it's a pretty darn good uh, heist and revenge tracking down the guy that's tracking you down story, cat and mouse, okay? And again, he set, sets up stuff for much later on and for down the road. Um, now come the four bigger ones at the very end of this run. I'm only going to do the original, I guess, uh, 16 or whatever, right? So... Um, that one starts with Deadly Edge, and Deadly Edge is is odd in that it's set, they rob a rock concert happening at a, like an a auditorium. They rob the box office inside an auditorium while there's a rock concert going on, and and that's cool. And then it turns into uh, Parker versus some bad guys, like these two drug addicted hippie weirdos and that part drags so I, the thing i like about this book okay the thing i like about it is again you have the heist which is fun and then you have parker versus the bad guys man to man the thing i don't like about this book i think it's too long and too wordy that's the problem with all four maybe not slayground but the other three of these remaining books is that they start getting too long, too wordy, and too complicated. For me, a Parker novel needs to be about 150, 160, 170 pages. Parker gets in, he does his thing, and he gets out. He gets his revenge, he gets his money, he pulls off the heist, and he goes home to Claire. That, to me, bang. And, and if it really want to put the cherry on top, Grofield helps and does some cool Grofield stuff. Bang. Then you've got a great Parker story. You don't want to drag it out and drag it out and drag it out. And they spend a lot of time dragging it out in this book. I think this book is about 30 pages too long. Okay. So it's, yeah, I'm going to give this one Deadly Edge. I'm going to give three and three quarter stars because it has some really good stuff in it, but it also kind of drags out. And I didn't like the, uh, the bad guys much. They were very annoying. Okay. Only got three to go. Slayground. Now, this is Westlake one last time, really, going back and doing a shorter, more concise, tight, single story. Right at the beginning of this story, and this is the, and obviously it's, it's a good one because Darwin Cook, this was his fourth, or 4.25 if you count the seventh, 
uh, adaptation. Um, in this one, uh, Parker pulls a job with Grofield at the very beginning of the story. It goes wrong, mainly because the driver's an idiot, and Parker ends up hiding out in a closed-down amusement park. It has shades of Arcade's Murder World from Marvel. It has shades of Live and Let Die, James Bond, with, with uh, I'm sorry, I keep saying Live and Let Die when I'm talking about this, Man with the Golden Gun. It has shades of the Man with the Golden Gun with, uh, with uh, Christopher Lee uh, in the Fun House, right? Um, it has a, <clears throat> has a lot of really ingenious ways that Parker comes up with to battle an army of bad guys coming to get him inside this locked up, covered in snow amusement park. So this one is a real gem. It, it's a little longer than I want it to be, and it goes a little too far to me on, we spend a whole lot of time on the bad guys, on the dirty cops, on the criminals, uh, the mobsters. So... I'm going to give this one 4.25. 4.25. I think this one could have been a five star, but he's got, again, this is where he's starting to run on longer than I want. It's not as concise. It's not as tight. And I, and I really don't want to spend chapter after chapter dealing with, with some of the characters you have in here. But otherwise, it's a great story. I might even go ahead and say 4.5. Let's give Slade Ground 4.5. I'm promoting it a quarter of a point as I think about it. So 4.5 for Slade Ground. Plunder Squad. And by the way, i got to tell you, I'm really surprised that, um, that I haven't found another five star. The score really has turned out to be the one I like the best. I wasn't sure about that when I started here. But, um, but the score really is the five star of the bunch. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll review quickly at the end. Okay, so Plunder Squad, this is another one that, in my opinion, suffers from a little bloat. Once again, you have the idea that Parker is going to pull a job with a team, a string of, of his allies. The problem here is, um, oh, I meant to mention, but Slayground, um, when Parker ends up in the amusement park, uh, Grofield ends up in a different situation which sets up one of the Grofield books. So the beginning of this book leads to the rest of this book, obviously, but also to a whole other book, which we'll talk about when we review the four Grofield books. Okay, Plunder Squad suffers from bloat. This is another one where he's getting more wordy. I don't know if his contract was different, called for the books to be longer. He's just putting more stuff in. It just feels padded, and it goes on and on. Uh, where they're trying to steal some paintings. If this was one of the mid-60s Parker books, there would have been one heist, they'd have stolen the paintings, and something would have come out of it. Now, I appreciate him trying to do something different. I don't want him to be too predictable, but the problem is what he does with it, it just kind of drags because he ends up having to deal with art critics. He has to deal with people with fences that want to buy them or not. And I'm just... At the, I was ready for this one to be over, honestly. I was just kind of done with it. I'm going to give... Because it's with the name Plunder Squad, it sounds like it should be awesome. And it's really disappointing in that way to me. So I'm going to give this one 3.75. I just couldn't... I was listening to this one on audio, and I just wanted it to be done. So 3.75. It's still a Parker story, and it's still fun in a lot of places, but it's not one of the better ones at all. Here it is, the Parker novel to end all Parker novels, and as they say on the back, and it nearly did for 23 years. This is Butcher's Moon. It is much smaller print than most of the Parker books, and it runs some 300 and something pages. You can tell how much longer it is for this in this way. Most of those on Audible are four and a half hours long to five hours long. This one is over eight hours long on Audible. It's not, I don't say bad. None of these are bad. These are all good. It's not, it's not, it's not as disappointing as, say, Plunder Squad or uh, Deadly Edge turned out to be to me. But it just goes and goes forever. And the Parker story in it is not bad. The Parker story in here is a pretty darn good story. In fact, what this really is, this is, this is like Parker going all the way full circle back to the hunter 
where he's mad at a mob boss and he starts out bringing in allies to do an epic takedown of the mob boss to show him you don't want to pay me money but look how much worse it is for you if you don't pay me money right so this is like this is like a big budget retelling of the hunter with a larger cast including Grofield and the best thing about this book to me the best thing about this book are the Grofield scenes you have two that I love Early on, there's a scene where Grofield is at his theater. We actually see him at the theater where Mary is from the score, his wife. You see him at the theater, and there's an IRS agent talking to him. Now, if you remember several volumes earlier, people had been scolding Grofield. Dude, you have to pay taxes. You know, Find a way to launder your money. Do whatever. Don't pay all the taxes you'd have to pay, but you've got to pay something. And Grofield's like, I don't pay any taxes. I'm a crook. Why would I pay taxes? Ha, ha, ha. And, of course, he has to deal with an IRS agent here. Now, if we never find out, this is the frustrating thing, is we never find out what happens. Because he, 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 he puts the guy off and puts the guy off, and then he goes off and helps Parker. And so this is the last one, really. So we never really find out, unless it's, unless it's in one of these others, uh, the, the, the late eight. Right. I'm looking for, I can't even remember, honestly, if Grofield is in the late eight or not, the eight, the eight books that come later. Um. I'll be finding out in a few weeks uh, when I do a review. When, when I do a review of those, we'll talk about it. I can't remember if we ever see Grofield again. But anyway, so here's uh, the mother of all early Parker books, the last one of the first string. Oh, oh, oh! The other great Grofield scene is later on when he and Parker, like I said, are like the dynamic duo, and Grofield does all the talking and Parker does all the glowering, and it's such a beautiful scene. And I love those two guys together. Uh, the parts I really don't like about this book, it well uh, let me all right let me back up and say one more thing. This book is the James Clavell novel, in more ways than one, right? Because it's huge for a Parker book, but also in Clavell's book, in Clavell's books like Shogun and Taipan and Noble House and King Rat and Whirlwind and Gaijin, all those, in those books, Noble House is where he brings all of the characters and things from the other books together. They all get mentioned in Noble House. And that's what this is. Basically, everybody who's ever pretty much been in a Parker book, or 80% of them, show up or are mentioned in this book. It's, it's, a, it's a family reunion of Parker characters in this book. And that's pretty cool. It's also a family reunion of every mobster in the, in the middle of the country. And there is just page after page after page of Delizias and Duchess and Duke and... Um, there's just all these criminals that show up and go on. Uh, Collision, Dulare, Bunadella. It's just mobster after mobster after mobster. And their story is probably that much of the book. And, I, you know, I understand that we need to know a little bit about the other side to really appreciate Parker doing his thing. But enough is enough. And this book would have been about two-thirds the size if he hadn't given us just basically the godfather it's like he watched the godfather and he probably did because this book came out in 74 so that was you know probably heavily influenced this book uh to be honest so and in fact they even quote the godfather in it when the criminals say we're going to the mats we're going to the mattresses and it says that's out of the godfather so clearly westlake had read or watched the godfather oh abandani Ab Ab Abadandi. Yeah, there's just so Lozini. There's just so many criminal, you know, mobsters in this book that he has to deal with. So it's got a great climax. The ending is awesome. Uh, it's got some great scenes along the way, but it just goes on and on. So I'm going to give Butcher's Moon, kind of like this review is. <laughs> so I'm going to give Butcher's Moon. A book with this much good in it, I can't give fewer than four stars. But there's too much in it that was annoying to go up close to five. I'm going to give Butcher's Moon four stars. Four stars. Um, it should have been better than that, but four stars is what it gets. All right, so a quick review. Um, I think I gave the score five stars. I was surprised how much I liked the Jugger and the Seventh and the Handle. 
So I'm going to go, and, and of course, Slay Ground is awesome, but I'm going to go ahead and say my favorites out of the whole series are the score, the jugger, the seventh, the handle, and the rare coin score. That run right there, books five, six, seven, eight, and nine, that is just in its prime. He's hitting his stride. That is the cream of the Parker books. Um, and it's not Claire that brings him down after that. She's not the problem. Okay, so that's my take on the, I guess, 16 original Parker books. I'll come back uh, in, in a later date and look at the, um, the remaining eight and then we'll look at the other books like the Growfield books. I hope you enjoyed this walk down Parker Memory Lane. Pick those up from the University of Chicago Press. They're also, like I say, on Audible. They're on Kindle. You can find them any which way. Uh, but they are at, And, of course, the Darwin Cook. Let me go ahead and roll one of those out here just so you can see. Here's Slayground. I might do a review of those four as well. Uh, there's Darwin Cook. Uh, the... Um, the graphic novel adaptations that, uh, the, that the late Darwin Cook did for IDW. Okay, gang, we're going to get on out of here. Uh, be sure to uh, visit patreon.com and look for Plexico. Just search Plexico, or you can go to www.plexico.net, P-L-E-X-I-C-O.net. Uh, you can find all of our other shows, other videos there, and you can help out the, um, the cause for White Rocket by uh, becoming a patron for as little as a dollar a month. Thanks a bunch, and we'll see you guys down the road.